All right, so chapter nine, we can't believe we're on chapter nine already. Um, yeah, so this chapter is on functionals, which to be honest, I read the chapter and still didn't quite understand why the, what the term functional means, but I'm gonna try my best here to <laughs> tell you what I learned. Um, all right, so yeah, so I'm gonna, some of the things I picked out is uh, talking about the map functions, a little bit about how you use different per commands together some of the map variants, a little bit about reduce. Um, and then I use some of these per functions quite a bit. Uh, so I was gonna talk about some, uh, some of the functions that I use that, that weren't in the chapter um, and an example of how I, how I use them. Um, and then we'll be using our old from the tidyverse with like a big focus on, on per. So what are functionals? As I just mentioned, I'm not exactly sure what the term functional meant, but what I gleaned from it is, you know, this is really a way to, <clears throat> uh, to write code without having to use as many loops or maybe any loops, depending on what you're doing. Um, and in general, a functional is gonna be better than a for loop, which will be better than a while statement, which will be better than repeat. Um, but if, although you can use these functions to, I think, make code more readable um, and yeah, maybe a little less circuitous, uh, there's, no, there's no reason that you have to like shoehorn everything into one of these functions. Like sometimes a loop is just the best way to go. Um, so I think we talked about uh, in our last meeting that you know, I was trying to iterate over an eval statement and um, the per functions really didn't allow me to do that. So in that case, like a for loop was what I think was still like the best approach to use. Um, but yeah, some of the benefits I think of using these are that it, when I think about when uh, using them, like I, I think that it really helps me like separate out the logic of the function from the logic of like iterating over something. So I think in the past I would write a for loop and I'd put all of that logic of like do this step and then do that step and do all this other stuff and uh, you know with eyes everywhere. By using some of these uh, functionals, you can kind of set up you know this is what my function is going to do and then have either a really small loop or um, yeah just throw it through one of the map the map statements um, to have it iterate but rather than uh, putting a lot of the logic inside a for loop um, it also has this really nice feature of just collapsing um, either vectors or data frames pretty easily and I'll show you some examples of that so the one that he starts out with is is just map um, so map uh, on its own is really just equivalent to an L apply. It's going to return a list and um, it's the most general of the map variants because there's, there's other variants of this function. Um, if this is the only feature you're going to use, he says, you know, you could just use the L apply. There's not like a big gain there, but if you use any of the other, um, if you use some of the other variants, then they, they, they play nicely together. But uh, map on its own is really equivalent to L apply. Um, and for map and then its variants, which will be on the next slide, uh, they all are gonna have the same, their output will be the same length as their inputs. Um, and so the general uh, like format of, of the map function is that it takes, uh, a, um, it takes a vector, which would be like this dot x parameter, uh, take a function that you'll use, and then in the dot dot dot, those are additional arguments you can pass to the function that you want it to iterate over. Um, so in the example, that he put and I put here, um, there's a triple function which is gonna take x and multiply it by three. So to use that with map, you would say, I wanna take uh, one through three and then I want to apply this triple function to that. So one becomes three, two becomes six, three becomes nine. Oh, oh I hit the wrong thing there. Okay. Um, so there's four variants uh, for working with atomic vectors. There's um, for characters, doubles, integers, and logicals. Um, and so when you use this, instead of it returning a list, it's going to return um, just an atomic vector. So instead of like the list of, you know, bracket, bracket one, and then bracket one is three, like it would just say like, right, it's gonna return three, six, and nine. So map, map double here is uh, taking that list and, and kind of uh, collapsing it into a, and just to a single vector. Um, and then map logical is another variant um, where you can pass it something that's going to evaluate true and false, and then it will bring back uh, just a vector of trues and falses for that. Um, so you, these also play nicely with anonymous functions and also something called the twiddle. So anonymous functions is just when you write like function x and then like write out what that function does um, without actually like assigning it to its own object in your environment. So you, it's just like a one-time use <clears throat> or you can use it multiple times, but um, this is where I see it the most. 
Um, so here I'm uh, using uh, map double because I want it to return a numeric vector. Um, and I want it to iterate across the columns of empty cars and grab the mean of each of the columns. So I did that and then I just grabbed the head because there was a lot of columns. So I just grabbed the first six. Um, but so it returns a um, it returns a value for each column. And uh, it's actually like a named vector here. So it's like the, the title is the, the name of the column and then the value below it is, is the mean of that value with um, NA, NA values removed. So another way you could write this, this would be how you would write it as like an anonymous function. Um, but you can also use the tilde to set it as a formula and they call this a twiddle, which I <laughs> didn't know until I read the chapter, um, but it's good to know. Uh, yeah, that, that's like a, a name for it. Um, so yeah, so here I am doing the same step. I'm saying, uh, so here I, I want it to return, um, again, like a, a vector of a numeric vector. Um, and I can just use the tilde and say mean of dot x. So it's dot x because that's like the, the name of the first parameter is dot x. So I say, uh, take twiddle and then the mean of dot x with an ARM equals true. You could simplify this even further without using the twiddle and just say, I want you to map over MT cars. I want you to grab the means and then that dot 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 parameter um, <clears throat> of the map functions, uh, I, can, I can give it things, uh, some of the inputs for, for the mean function. So mean takes a parameter called NARM. So I can, I can pass that here. So yeah, these are just like three ways to write the same, the same uh, steps. So uh, per style, um, yeah, like sometimes you're going to use multiple, uh, you're going to do um, many of these steps together in, in one go. So here I'm taking the empty cars and the first step I'm doing is just to say um, grab 20 rows for each column. So it's going to loop across the columns of empty cars and it's going to grab the first 20, uh, the first 20 uh, items of the Sorry, I heard her little noise there. Um, it's going to take the first 20 elements. And then, uh, and then after that, so, so it's going to take each column, it's going to grab 20 elements, and then I'm going to map over that and grab the means of all of them. And then I'm grabbing just like the first six. So that's like a way that you would, you would like mm -hmm. use multiple of these together. And then as I was thinking through this, I actually used some of these recently with the Tidy Tuesday um, from actually, I guess, from quite a while ago, uh, from, from June. Um, but here I brought in the data set for Tidy Tuesday, which was around X-Men comics. And uh, so my mapping variable were the first three data sets. So uh, this was a list of data frames. So I took the first three data frames and then in all of them, I wanted to filter for um, certain issues. And then I wanted to name the time frames for like first five years and last five years. And then I wanted um, to only select if, um, so I said like, what's the proportion of NA? And if the proportion of NA is less than 20%, then like bring that column back. So that eliminated a lot of, um, a lot of like mostly empty columns. I don't think there were a ton, but there was like enough that I <laughs> threw it in here. So yeah, so the first step is just uh, go, go through those, those data sets and apply this filter, create this new variable called time frame, and then just bring back the, the, um, the columns that have uh, like less than 20% nulls or NAs. So that was like the first step using map. And then I use iWalk, which I'll talk about in a little bit to, uh, to assign them all to my global environment. So that way, like in one go, it like took all those, a list of data frames and then assigned them to my, to my global environment. And I'll, I'll kind of talk through like how this iWalk works uh, in a little bit. So um, there's actually many variants, more than just the map DBL, map LGL. Um, there are maps, map twos, IMAP and PMAP. And then there's like analogous um, functions for atomic vectors. Uh, if it's the same type, so if you're just kind of like modifying it, almost like a mutate. Um, and then if you, uh, he says nothing, but it's kind of like a, if you don't want to see the output. The walk is like a little harder for me to explain, but I think I'll show you an example and hopefully it'll make a little more sense. Um, but yeah, so if you have a list, you can use map or map to these guys. If it's an atomic vector, you can use these guys. If you want to just modify it, um, kind of in place. And then uh, if you don't want it to kind of like spit out like its steps as it's going along and just invisibly do the calculation for you, you can use these walk commands. So in the example here where I used iWalk, like I wanted it to go and assign to my environment and I didn't want it to like spit out all the steps it was doing along the way. 
Um, so iWalk will just kind of like invisibly assign it all, but not print stuff out in the console. So map2 is a really useful function. It's similar to map, um, but you can give it two parameters. So here I'm using map double uh, to just uh, raise each of these x values by uh, to the power of two. But here I actually want to um, have that also be variable. So I want to raise one to the power of two. I want to raise two to the power of three, three to the power of four. So I'm, I have like a variable x input and I have a variable y uh, parameter here. And then I'm using the twiddle just to say like raise x by that y value. So um, yeah, so that's like a, a nice feature is the map to variance. So walk, so what I was saying where it like spits stuff out in the console. So here I said just, uh, um, yeah, just like print the value of, of dot x and then like put it on a new line. And so it will print that, but then it'll also print kind of like the steps of it going through those iterations. And it's kind of, uh, for my purposes here, like I'm just trying to like print it out. I don't really need that step. Um, I can I can just use walk instead and it'll just print those three values and not really give me this information about its like process and, and like going through the, the iterations. So if you're doing something like write CSV, GG save, um, or like printing, uh, you might want to use walk instead so that you don't get this output of it like going through the the um, of it uh, iterating over over that vector. Um, I think I'm going kind of quick, quick. I'm just going to pause for a sec. Does anyone have any questions about what I've said so far, or um, if you understood the content differently than, than I've explained it? This is sounding good so far to me. Okay. Yeah, some of the stuff with walk, I was like, I don't really know how to explain it, but I, I do choose it sometimes. Um, cool. Yeah, I hadn't used really these I commands um, until relatively recently, but um, it, it's nice. So in the past, I might have had to pass, like, I want you to like grab the name of the vector and then do something with that vector. So here I want to say, like, um, like the, this, this column has a mean of, and then like for it to go, like get the mean of, of, of dot x. Um, but with IMAP, if, if, uh, if the vector has a name, so like the columns are going to have names, um, dot dot y uh, is like derived as the names of of your dot x variable. So um, because yeah, each of my columns of empty cars has a name, um, I'm able to to use this dot y even though it wasn't something that I like explicitly named. And this this happens when you use the i i map i walk um, function. So um, so yeah, so I. Both of these are going to return the same the same result, um, but it's just a little less verbose in the IMAP um, because that that y is like derived. Now, if uh, the vector you're passing through does not have a name, um, then it will just uh, use its index. So it will still create a dot y parameter for you to interact with, but it's just going to be um, the index of of that value. So um, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure. If this had been two through four, it would still pop back one, two, three because it's like the order of it iterating. So it's it's like index in the in the vector, not necessarily like the value of x. So if I wanted, <clears throat> I should have done that example instead of this example just to make that more clear. Um, but yeah, but so in the IMAP, the the dot y gets gets derived either from the name of the vector or its its index as it as it loops through. But otherwise, they have the same properties of the the map character map logical etc. PMAP's pretty cool. So PMAP uh, will allow you to like to give multiple uh, like varying criteria. So um, so for run if run if takes the parameters of n, min, and max. I think it takes might take some other stuff. But um, if I if I create a little tibble or a list where I set n, min, and max, or n, min, and max, I can just use that in PMAP, and then run if will will use those inputs in each of the iterations and bring back, um, yeah, the results um, based on those criteria for each time that it runs. So this time it, uh, mm, yeah, so like the first one, it's going to uh, bring back a length of one with the min of one and the max of 10. 
in the second iteration, it's going to bring back a, a, a vector of length two with the min of 10 and a max of 100. And then the third will be uh, uh, of length three with the min of 100 and the max of 1,000. So you can pass it as either a, um, a data frame or a list. Um, and I think this is pretty similar to, to, uh, to do call. I think in dplyr, I think you can also like send your parameters as a, as a list. Um, but it's, it's nice. I have one of the packages I've been working on. All of the functions take essentially the same arguments. So you can just create a little list of your parameters and then like pass it to each of the functions to get this like analysis going through the, the different steps of, that the, the package provides. Um, I haven't used reduce before, but um, the examples that he chose were um, the function intersect. So with intersect, if you give it um, two vectors, it will tell you which of those values overlap. Um, so if you just, so in this case, uh, he's sampling um, the numbers one through 10, uh, 15, like um, it, as vectors of 15. So from the numbers one through 10, like grab 15 random numbers and with replacement equals true, which means it will recycle the numbers one through 10 as it pulls out 15 values. Um, and then it's doing this four times. So it's going to grab 15 numbers and then 15 numbers and then 15 numbers. And then reduce is gonna say, what's the overlap between those four iterations of, of pulling that sample? Um, and so if I just say reduce, it's just gonna bring back like the result of that. But if I use accumulate, it's actually gonna show me uh, how it got to that value. So although, um, yeah, like when it when it ran the, that sample of 15 and it ran that four times, by the end, the only two values that remain constant were the numbers 10 and eight. But if I used accumulate, it will say, all right, well, this was the first iteration. So the first is when it just sampled that. The second is when <clears throat> it intersected the, the second iteration with the first. And so these numbers remain. And then it says, all right, of those numbers and the third iteration, which numbers remain? And then in the fourth, which numbers remain? And so by the end, it just ends up being 10, the numbers 10 and eight. Um, so reduce will just do it all in one step and accumulate will show you like the individual breakdown um, as it's like going through that process. Um, so I didn't see the map DF variants in the text. Um, but I use map DFR and DFC quite a bit. Uh, these are really nice. So it will just, as it goes through, um, as, as it like goes through the iterative process, it will um, like append the rows together. And it, 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 the R is essentially like a row bind and the C is like a C bind. So you can say, so here I'm, I'm saying um, like do some stats, like uh, given like a value N, grab N rows from empty cars, summarize all the columns as means, um, floor is just to like turn them back into integers, um, and then paste a little statement at the end telling me like what the end size was. So then um, this is just a little quick way to get the numbers 10 and 20, but I said map over 10 and 20, and then like run this call stats function. So if I just do this using map, um, it's gonna bring them back as a list. So the first um, element of my list will be like the first time it runs with N of 10, the second time will be with n of 20. But if you use dfr, it will collapse them into a data frame for me, which is like a, you know, it's often what I would do. I feel like in the past, I would say like, hold these results, like make this little empty data data set or this little empty data frame. And then in my for loop, I will say like r bind to the data frame, r bind to the data frame, but this will just do it all for you in like one go, um, which can be really helpful. Um, um, I feel like pluck was mentioned briefly, but uh, I wanted to just highlight it um, for you here. So pluck is going to like pull an element from a list. So if I have a list of, of three items, one is a vector of one through three, um, one is 10 through or 11 through 15, and one is 21 through 30. And then I say pluck one, it's going to like grab the first item of my list, which is that vector of one through three. Um, so all right, so yeah, so 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 I said take take my list, which is this object here, and pluck the first element. So that element is this this vector of one through three. But then if I say map pluck, it's going to grab the first element from each of the items in my list. So the first item is going to be one. The second is going to be one or ten plus one, which is eleven, and then um, the third one would be twenty plus one, which would be twenty one. So um, you can map over. Uh, you can map over a list and then like pluck the first element, which is nice. 
And then, uh, I'm just trying to think. Oh yeah, and then and then I used map DBL here so that it like collapses into a vector. So instead of it returning a list again, so like my input was list, the output of map is also going to be a list. If I want it to actually just pull back a vector, bring back a vector, I can use map D DBL to uh, to vectorize it. Um, flatten I've used also, and uh, again like I'm not sure I can explain it super well, but um, what it does is essentially like returns a simpler vector. So if you have um, a list, all right, so so in this list, object A is going to be just a vector, and then object B is going to be a list of, of the numbers one through three. So, um, so if I, oh, sorry guys, map if. I'm gonna skip this because I uh, <laughs> I feel like it made more sense in my brain last night. But um, but here I'm mapping. I'm using map if, and so I say if the item is a list, then flatten it into integers. So it's going to uh, when it finds this, it's going to flatten. Will return a simpler vector. So because this was a list, it will now be <clears throat> just a vector of like one through three instead of a list of one through three. Um, and then uh, I can say yeah. Uh, do the same step. So uh, if it's a list, flatten it. So I get that one, two, three, one, two, three, and then I can like flatten it again. And then instead of these being uh, a list of two, it will take them and put them all into like one big vector of the um, like list A and list B are getting or uh, A and B are getting collapsed into just a, a, a vector of, of the collection of of integers in, in those two vectors. And then. Um, yeah, another way that I've used these is uh, in parsing JSON or XML. Um, so this is an example. Um, recursive, and I got this. Alpha one is Jenny Bryan's. I can like pulling repos one will pull like the first uh, element of that list, which will be um, the first repo that I want to look at. Otherwise it'd be like repos bracket, bracket one, bracket, bracket one. So flatten just kind of like moves that up a, a level. Um, and here I just pulled the structure to just show you. So I've got, um, you know, repos one ID is this name, you know, these all make sense. But then when I get into owner, like there's another nested list inside that where there's like, uh, repos one dollar sign owner dollar sign login to get like that person's login information. Um, and so I could uh, kind of use all these steps together to, to bring back um, like a data set describing these repos using like some of these functions I, I've described like the map and the map character and pluck. So I said like oh, go go across all repos and like pluck the ID. So this will bring back this repo ID for me. Um, the owner name was like two in, right? So it's like owner and then ID, or uh, I think I grabbed the login name. Um, yeah, owner and then login. So I said, yeah, go across all of the repos, um, pluck the owner, and then go one step further and like pluck the login. Um, so it brings back like the first login for each, um, which in all of these instances, it was only a length of one, but it just like allows me to like bring that back and like put into this, this tibble that will describe all of these repos. Then use map int because size was an integer. Um, yeah, all, all the rest of these were, uh, these were counts, the number of times it was forked. Um, and then this created that uh, variable I was also interested in. And then or, like I just sorted it by the number of watchers to figure out which, which repos were like the most, uh, I don't know, of interest to other people. So uh, that's what I put together for you guys. Um, that was like how I've understood this topic and, and how I've used some of these functions. I'm curious what questions came up for you in reading the chapter. Hey Jake, uh, it's Kevin. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, go ahead, Kevin. I, I was just gonna briefly uh, say awesome job. Uh, sorry, I was running late. I totally lost track of time. Um, but uh, I was just gonna say, this is a really cool, especially your last slide here is really neat. 
combination of like mapping and plucking that I never thought of. Like I deal with JSONs a lot and um, just thought it was really kind of like ingenious how, how you combine those two things here. Um, so I just say it like I'm super grateful because it's going to save me a lot of time now, I think, uh, with like annoyingly recursive and like nested uh, JSON formats. So um, I thought that was really cool. I, I couldn't find, thanks. Yeah, I'm glad that it's helpful. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't find an example that would be easy to share with you, but one of the projects I was working on had just this like wild JSON that had all these nested data frames inside of it. Um, and so it, there's also like this flattened data frame thing you can do. So you can say like uh, within this list, find this data frame and like flatten it to like, I don't know. The, uh, I could try to find it later and, and like share it with the group. I just need to like simplify it. But um, I don't know. These, these functions have been so helpful because prior to learning about this, I was just like completely intimidated by JSON and XML. Um, so yeah, once I've learned some of this, I, I still feel like I fumble a little bit, but I definitely feel like I can get jogging much faster than I did in the past. So I'm glad to hear that it might be helpful to you. Yeah, I, I want to um, uh, second what Kevin said that um, I'm, I'm, I think as soon as this is over, I'm going to download your slides and look at your code very carefully because um, you're doing, you're clearly doing things that I should be doing and I have not been doing and my code is running very inefficiently and I need to learn this stuff. I need, need to be able to do this stuff. And I'm, so I'm glad that you, you got away from the examples of the book and gave us some real world applications because um, sometimes I get frustrated with the, with the applications in the book because it's just uh, generate a, a vector of random numbers and then do an operation. It's not interesting to me. You know, I don't really care. Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I struggled with trying to pull stuff out of the examples was like some of it, I didn't even know what he was talking, like uh, like some of the functions he was using as the examples. I was like, I don't even know what that function does. Um, yeah, whatever, whatever uh, example. Like like yeah. I mean, we, we, have, we, have, we have built in data sets in R and, 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 and dplyr, you know, even something like empty cars or, or penguins or whatever. But I, to, to start with set seed, random number, it's such a, a computer jock thing to do. You know, it, it's like, give me something that I can actually, you know, eat here. <laughs> that I can actually look at and say, oh, I see what you want to do here. It, 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 yeah. it makes me frustrated in going through the book in general. I, I, I think it, it starts from a, a computer junkie level. Where, and, and, and my friends who are big into programming, um, uh, uh, they'll always do this. You know, here's a vector of random numbers. And I'm like, why can't you just use, you know, something interesting and, you know, make, make it make more sense. So, so Jake, I really appreciate that you did that. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad that helped. I was going to say, I feel like <clears throat> some of the situations that I found per the most helpful in, and like realistically the only thing I use it for with any regularity is the like read in a million files, a million, you know, CSVs generated from some other program and uh, that some like biologists wrote in their basement in 1995 and we're still using. Um, thank God it has a CSV output. Yeah. Uh, and get the data out and, and then, you know, like put it back away. And even that, like the fact that I could do that just blew my mind when I first started doing it. it yeah, it feels like such a, um, a revelation from, yeah. It, but, but I think that's kind of part of the issue is like where per and where the map functions really shine like map df saves my life but where they really shine is with with exactly the kind of like messy data that you just can't give as an example in a book in like a code chunk you know because like what's he gonna do like give us like a million csvs to read in um right so um but yeah the your your examples are really actually really useful i'm i'm gonna do the same thing as mike i'm gonna pull them through and i'm, I'm just trying to like get better myself at reading code and seeing what's happening um so that's thank you so much for for providing those i appreciate it have you used walk have any of you guys used walk or i i didn't feel like i explained well like why you would pick it instead but uh i, I know mostly when i'm like saving plot outputs or something i'll end up using walk because it just starts like printing all this stuff in my console that isn't 
really useful. But is there another reason folks might use walk over map? Yeah, I've never used it. Um, I think often I just kind of ignore <laughs> the console output and then just like look to see what sure. the object is. Yeah, that's produced. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I should, but. Or maybe not. Maybe I should just ignore it. <laughs> I can see if you're like modifying objects, the walk may be fine if you had a bunch of outputs and you were just modifying things in place. Um, potentially useful there because you're running a bunch of like actions, but you don't care about the printout from those actions. I've never done it though. So that's what I've seen. Um, like Josh said, I, I haven't used it, but I've looked at help pages for it and then uh, wandered off into something else and been like, oh, I'm not going to do that. But I, that's when I've, when I've heard, when I've seen people talk about it, that's um, usually the, yeah, it's like some sort of intermediate step where you don't want the output, um, but you want, you know, the next thing that comes from it. So I like the name of that. Uh, I like the name of walk because it's not, it's not something I'm going to get confused with other things or it's like you're walking past your output. Uh, mm. And does somebody or does anyone know what why the package is named per? I just thought the three R's were like repetition. I don't know. A smooth running engine. I don't know. What what are your thoughts? Oh. Okay. Okay. Maybe it's a cat thing. I mean, I, I understand four cats is an anagram of factors. So right. that and it's four categories. And so it means four that. categories, yeah, which I yeah. didn't realize until yeah. I heard how they talk. <laughs> so I, I like that. I like that uh, um, uh, play on words. But I've never quite gotten per. Yeah, I wonder if that's, I wonder if that's up somewhere. So I didn't go all into it because um, I just couldn't find like a quick and easy description, but um, in the IMAP, Map and pmap stuff, uh, you can like hold certain values constants. So, like if you want everything to like be increased by an exponent of like a certain value, you can like make that value constant and then like let other variables uh, like, um, uh, yeah, be variable. Um, so I didn't, I didn't like go into that really at all, but um, you can kind of like mix and match with the like map to an imap and pmap. Like you can say, I want, I want these things to be variable and I want these other like parts of like the inside of the, the function to, to be um, to be static. So I uh, we just want to point out that that's something you, you, you do have a little control over. Um, one, one thing, yeah. well, and sorry, uh, are you gonna build on that? No. Okay. <laughs> I uh, just quickly um, the you asked about like questions that came up um, and this comes up a lot or has come up a lot for me when I've used per is like like the map functions is um, maybe this is wrong but it feels like when I have a bunch of data frames like in a list and then I and do something with per and then I bind them to a single data frame it takes up a lot more memory it seems like when it's in a data frame versus a list, is that possible? I, I, maybe I'm just hallucinating, but like, it feels like that happens. It just like, it, it takes up more space. You know, when I look in the, the viewer pane, um, I guess it's easy to test, but has anyone noticed that or is, is that not right? I don't know. I don't, I don't personally, I haven't, I haven't paid attention. Is that using um, just is just regular versions of map or with like map DF or something like that? Uh, to... I think it's just I think it's just map uh, okay. or like pmap or something. Yeah, um, where like it I haven't used the fancy combined like uh, bind a map uh, that right. Jake showed, but um, but yeah, I don't know. I just I mean maybe it's just because I'm saving a new object and like it's like really big so it like because I notice it because like it really like sometimes I run out of memory after that step um and yeah right so so like so maybe it's because it's just I'm just not overwriting what was there before and it, like it's it just saving something new but I, I feel like I've seen it where 
like it's not just about the new object but it's like takes up more space but i don't know maybe i'll fool around with some of the stuff that i've worked with and see if i can produce an example um but yeah if you do just, if you do make an example you should show us because i'd like to see yeah yeah I don't know, something something about it yeah. yeah it's possible that that's happened to me and i just haven't like noticed I, I don't work with anything that's huge enough that it would like run out of memory um but yeah yeah i also feel like i've like somehow screwed up my art studios like memory management uh and mm. i don't know yeah it, i don't know uh, it, like i tried to i was like running out of space once and i tried to change like the memory limit um, and, uh, and, and then like my whole computer started freezing and, uh, it doesn't freeze that much, but like, I, I'm not sure if I switched it back to what it was before. So, uh, I don't know. My, my art studio just maybe screwed up. You might want to switch the, like, cause I assume you used a code and like edit the R environment and like the use this package. So you probably just want to switch that back. Like, I think you probably have it set too high. And so once you get into that space, your, your your computer RAM isn't available and it just saturates everything and then it crashes. Mm -hmm. I've also okay. taken the brakes off my R so it uh, could use all the RAM, um, but it doesn't crash my computer because I think I, I set it slightly lower than it possibly could break it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, you said use this. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I, I'll double check what I actually use, but. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I'll check that out. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll, I'll put it in the Slack uh, or sorry, in the chat. What, uh, what do I use? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like in those moments where I notice like how much like memory Chrome and like, like video chat takes up and stuff. And I'm like, Oh God, this is, ter this is terrible. But, okay, cool. I'll check that out. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the one thing I found in this is that almost everything that Hadley recommends not doing, I do all the time. Um, I use apply and s apply and l apply instead of all the per functions. And like, he's like, don't use apply on data frames. So I'm like, I could see why you tell me not to do that. And I'm looking at my code and it's literally just that. So, um, I found this was really interesting because I really hadn't spent the time to learn how to use map because I didn't really feel like I needed to, but there are some, like everything else with Tiverse, there are some things where it just makes things more idiot proof and smarter that I really appreciate. So I think I'll uh, take that up, especially that one that you were just showing Jake was really cool. The, um, the combined, the um, binding rows. I feel like that's something I would actually apply um, that I don't have right now. I constantly do the same thing where I'm appending at the bottom of a, of a um, for loop or something like that. Yeah, I found them really helpful. Did did you all look at the exercise questions? Do you have any? Uh, I don't know. Some of them I just I was like I don't know the answer to this. I tried to do the iWalk one that he had, and I got confused for a second, but figured it out once I understood that is top it? Y is the index. Uh, it's the end of section four. Number two. Okay. So the advantages that what was the disadvantage of using it? Did you find one? I mean, the advantage is on one line. Disadvantage seemed that it was considerably more confusing to read. Okay, <laughs> sure. 
Um, but that was the only difference I really noticed. You also don't need to define paths, I guess, is it? you don't have a paths object. Why is it called a functional? That part didn't make sense to me. Because it sounds like he just says a functional is a function. Did you read the intro? Because I think that there's like a click on the intro and there's like a chart that just explains it. Like go to the, oh, you're there. Go to the bottom. Oh no, go to the, oh no, like above chapter nine. Go to introduction. Like on the left. Yeah, click on introduction. This, this clarified it for me. And now scroll to the bottom. This thing. <laughs> that explains it. I was like, what the hell is he talking about? And then I looked at this and I was like, okay, sure. Uh, yep, I'm not realizing oh, I, guess I didn't, because... didn't read the introduction to the section. <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't either. And then I, I was like, what is this functional thing? So I looked at that and and that puts it that like that made it make sense to me. I was like, oh, okay, you can. I guess you can call it that. So because this is because this is a function, that's what makes it a functional. Yeah, because it like, takes a function and, and outputs a vector or some other thing. What is it? Yeah, it takes a function and returns a vector or a list or something. I see. Thank you. Yeah, I totally skipped over that. Yeah, <laughs> me too at first. And then I was like, this is a weird word. I think it comes from linear algebra. I think it's they're trying to use a lot of the same applications with map, reduce, and mm -hmm. um, functional would all be terms taken from that that they've applied to computer science. Is function factory a term from linear algebra? I hope not. <laughs> I'm kidding. Interesting. I'll also pile on to the complimenting of Jake. Uh, looking at his code, <laughs> I know, looking at his code at, at work like was part of why I started using a lot of the map stuff. So, you know. You're, uh, you're uh, my godfather of, of, oh God. of math yeah. functions. <laughs> I thought you were going to call it your inspiration. No. Although my experience <laughs> with math functions is that, and like that whole thing, is that um, I go into it thinking it's going to be really easy, and then I find myself in a big mess. Um, and I guess I usually, I, I, but I'm also pretty new at it. So that's probably why as well. But I feel like, yeah, hopefully that gets, that'll like, I think it comes with practice, I assume. But um, I always think it's going to be easy. And then I'm like, oh, I didn't quite think this out well enough. Hmm. I want to find so, that example. Can you just Yeah. I'll say, uh, for your anonymous functions, you seem to have multiple lines, which he recommends not doing. So long as you can pipe it together and it looks reasonable, is that something that you normally do? Um, say that again. Here? Like uh, your anonymous functions in your personal code that you showed generally have more than one line, like you're doing more than one thing kind of sequentially like instead of defining the function and then uh, and then calling the function is like he, he recommends not using that practice, but yeah, like, yes, exactly. That like the, that's just two lines, but yeah. Um, is that kind of your maximum? Yeah, I think called out on, I've been called out on stack overflow for it. And I was like, I don't care. Like I'm not yeah. making a whole function just for this one little step. Oh yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, like if I'm not repeating it more than once or, it's hard for me to like use that rule. Um, yeah, I mean, mine's way dirtier, so like I'm not gonna. 
say that I'm better or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think yeah. readability I mean, is I, the I, key, I'd like right? to see how other people could rewrite this. Like, yeah, I'm definitely open to, to learning a better, better way to write it. Um, like, what were we going to say there? But, uh, oh, I say I, don't, I like to create the functions because I can test it. Like I always think the functions like, okay, if I can do it once, I can do it map. So I like to create the function to make sure that I can do it once. Yeah, I guess I could see something. So you're, you're going within owner to find the login information. So I guess if, if it was something you were going to be doing like literally hundreds of times, maybe it would be worth having a, a function that, and you could, I guess you could then put it or, you know, use it for something else if you're working with the same kind of data, but in a different, you know, trying to do something different with it. Um, but then I guess it would be, I mean, presumably this isn't data you own, because then I would be like, hey, let's put in a column for this information that I need. Uh, but, but in terms of readability, because I, I actually, I appreciated that about I feel like that was ma the major point Hadley was trying to make is like, if it's readable, you know, the, the, the reason not to use for loops isn't that it's slow, which I, I guess is like some kind of our old wives tale. Um, it's that it's, it's really trying to emphasize like readability for other users. So if you, if you're familiar enough with, if you know your audience is going to be familiar enough with the pipe and, um, map functions to follow what you're doing it's probably good and if not it's probably better to do a function like Jorge says. I want to just find uh, where he kind of shows you how to write it in base R because I thought that was really really helpful. Uh, I glaze here. over the base R stuff sometimes. I think it's a uh, yeah, you could do it like this or because the pipes don't exist you could do it like this or as a loop. I feel like the thing that the case that I struggle with with map functions is like with um, uh, conditional stuff. Like if you want to do something different for like different types of like objects in the list, uh, I don't know. Like I, I have a tougher time writing something that's like clean uh, with, with map. So there's map if which you can use. Oh. Um, so you can say if it's, if it's numeric, do this. Um, so like if it's a factor, make it a character. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think someone pointed out last time, maybe it was Ezra or someone uh, said, I uh, mentioned also the, the bit about safely, right? Um, mm -hmm. And like, because sometimes I do it because there are a few that are going to like produce errors, but like I still want it to go through. Uh, so maybe that's that's also a solution. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it was always there, but um, I definitely had trouble where an item is null in the list. Like I want it to go through all of them, but some of them don't have. Um, there's nothing there when it goes to that part. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, it will dig into high charter, which is like a. I think it's like a D3 type of um, the Kai charts. It's a, it's a plotting library. Um, and I don't know, we'll like dig into the guts, like pull stuff out of it. And sometimes there's like not the same element, like the lists aren't all the same length. And when you ask it to like pull that one for one of the, one of like, maybe I have several lines, uh, cause we have like confidence intervals and like a, a main metric. Um, and I'll like want it to pull one of them and it doesn't exist for one of the elements. Um, it, it, Think like a null there. Ezra, you and I had this, uh, right? Where it was like pulling back nulls and so it was like throwing something weird. So we had to create a function to say like if it's null. Yeah. Then but, like but also though, like order. Yeah. We we did that, but I think like so bef that was before I knew about pluck, but I think pluck will like return an NA or something if it doesn't like, cause I remember we went over that example and then I was thinking after I read about pluck that we could have used pluck because I think it returns null or to returns NA if you, 
if you call for an index or a name that doesn't exist. Yeah, which is nice. Like that's honestly a nice feature, especially with map. It makes, yeah. I, I feel like I've also run into that problem when like uh, I've like dropped, like filtered out from a list, but then the level, like the object is like still there, but it's null and I have to like do something with dropping unused like elements or items in a list. Like I remember that was also part of it too for me, um, that type of problem. I had an unrelated question. I was wondering about parallelization um, with per. You make some comment about it, but I, I don't know of any code. You didn't show any code. And that's one of my hesitations in switching is I use a lot of parallelization on LApply. So I just wondered if you guys had used it and what is the calls that you used? I saw someone tweet about it. Isn't, isn't fur? Uh, is that what it's called? Parallelized fur? Yeah, I've never used it, but I just saw, I was trying to figure out how to do something better with Purr and came across it and like that looked promising. It's like a different package, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I, like, I think it's the data, I think it's by the data.table, like whoever that is. also a web page for a feline rescue so if you need if you need a kitten for adoption from new hampshire that's also a fur option <laughs> i think it's Many a kittens future at once. and fur mixed together yeah uh. yeah i was curious too i thought for some reason i thought that fur was per pa parallelized i don't know um <laughs> Uh, but, it, but it wasn't. Um, so I've been curious also. So yeah, maybe, maybe sure. Yeah, I just came across this, like someone was talking about it. I've never used it. Uh -huh. Josh, how do you typically um, parallelize your like L apply and S apply stuff? Is that like within the function? I don't, I don't know anything about um, parallelization. Um, yeah, so I set the number of cores that I'm willing to overuse and then um, I'll just create like a anonymous function where I'm using either like an index or a list uh, as my inputs and then run some something on it. And so it splits the data up either if you set it up so it'll um, you can either have it so pre-assigns or doesn't and sometimes you need to check with what your function you're doing. It's kind of a little bit of a guessing game but you can either pre-assign the memory and so it, it sets everything up for you and then it runs all of them and then brings it back together at the end or I can just go one at a time, sending it to the next one that's available. Um, but yeah, usually don't use all your cores because your computer has other things it wants to do, but like cores minus a couple is all right. And your computer is going to be running like, uh, it sounds like it's just a fan running on high the whole time. Um, yeah, my fiance regularly says my computer sounds like it's dying. So that's basically what's happening. Is that, I mean, is there, I mean, using it with per, isn't there, you can just set that as like a setting for the computer for what you're running, right? This, I'm not, you can tell I'm not a computer person, but I've definitely like, I've, for, for other software, I've set like optimum number of cores, like please use more than you're using. Oh. Uh, so I wonder if that, if, if just doing that for per, this isn't really important to the discussion of functionals. No, I, I was just curious. I don't know. Yeah, because um, I, I have to. Josh, what's that? Which package do you use for parallel? Oh, uh, I use uh, MCL apply, uh, which is that's the function, and I think it's parallel as the package. I'm, now I'm trying to remember what I what I did for this. This was for a finite element analysis that similarly made my computer sound like it was going to explode. Um, this is really cool. Josh, when you do that, do you find that like it reduces the time by like the number of cores? Like it's, it's not linear, but it's, it, I mean, it's close because there's a setup cost and, um, and a teardown cost to, to making like multi-threaded, but there is, it is faster. 
So like I'll run 10 and I'll get like eight X speed kind of thing. That's now, all I need to start doing this. Yeah, Kevin, the big concern though, is that your memory, you're now producing, like if you had a bunch of processes that were running four gigabytes before, or one process running four gigabytes, you now have like 10 of them. So that's mm -hmm. 40 gigabytes of RAM that you're using. Mm -hmm. So you have to be mindful of what you're doing, especially if you're creating um, big, big data frames. And that's kind of right. where I've, I've blown up my RAM on my computer before is I'll get something that's like, I have a two gigabyte data frame coming in um, and then I run eight of these and now I've got, you know, that's 16 gigabytes of stuff and if any augmentation happens or if a copy happens, I'm just toast. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I should just fix my do the use this stuff and then do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Once you, <laughs> once you have that all figured out, but that's why I took yeah. the brakes off because I need a more virtual RAM space than um, our thought it could give me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I got to run to the other class, but thanks Jake. Uh, this is awesome. Thank you. Yeah, this is yep. really great. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. Got to run too. Uh, I'll uh, look, talk in the chat about who wants to present next week. Yeah. So everyone can head uh -huh. off. All right. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. Thank you.